If you have your Bibles this morning, open to the book of Ephesians chapter 5, and I'm going to preach on the family today, and I didn't know Brother Teddy was going to say all he said last night, because I said he's jumping all over my sermon, but so God must really be nailing us this, this week with this, all right? Ephesians chapter 5, and I will show you something I've never seen before, but how many knows family matters? Family matters to God. Families should matter to us, but let's open our Bibles and let's look at verse 15 of chapter 5. Ephesians 5, verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So I don't. You know, I don't know the will of God for all of your lives. You know, I mean, God has destiny on each one of you. But I can tell you one thing. I can tell you the will of God in one area of your life at least. Verse 18, do not be drunk. That's the will of God. Amen. Do not be drunk with, he says what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine. In which is dis- dissipation, but... Be filled with the Spirit. So the will of God is that you not be drunk, but be filled with the Spirit. And there's an interesting, that we can look at this as a contrast or a comparison. There's a contrast because when you're drunk, you're out, you don't have full control of your senses, but when you're filled with the Spirit, you do. When you're drunk, you're going to wake up with a hangover, but when you're filled with the Spirit, you won't. When you're drunk, you can do some stupid things, but when you're filled with the Spirit, you won't. So there's a contrast. But there's also a comparison. When you're drunk, you may stumble around. When you're filled with the Spirit, you may stumble around. When you're drunk, you might need a designated driver. I've had a designated driver take me home from church before. I remember when Brother Ted was here a few years ago, he laid hands on me up here and I started laughing uncontrollably on the platform and I felt like a drunk man. No wonder they said in Acts chapter 2 when they were filled with the Spirit, you know, Peter said, these are not drunk like you think. So evidently people were saying, are these guys drunk in the middle of the day? So there's a contrast and there's a comparison. But going down further and he says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then notice this, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now, what in the world does this have to do with family? Well, there's something going on in the grammar. First of all, there is an imperative. There's a command. He says, be filled with the Spirit. In the original language, that is a continual verb which means be filled and continually filled with the Spirit. Be filled and continually filled with the Spirit. But though it is an imperative, it's a command, it's followed by several participles that attach to it. Okay? And so here it is. Be filled, a command, and here are the participles attached. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing, making melody in your heart, giving thanks, and submitting. Now when he gets to the submission part, the next section, he talks about husbands and wives and fathers and children. He talks about the family at the tail end of this section about being filled with the Spirit. And it grammatically connects. And let me work through this, we're going somewhere, all right? And even though when he gets to the husband and wife relationship, he's looking at it as an analogy of Christ and the church, still yet we can learn something through it, okay? And so it all connects. So so where am I going? So what God wants in a family is He wants a Spirit-filled family. God wants you to have a Spirit-filled family. This is the will of God. Be filled with the Spirit. Here comes the family teaching. Be filled with the Spirit. Have a Spirit-filled family. 
Well, that isn't possible. Yes, it is possible. I'm living proof. It is possible. Have, look at your neighbor and say, have a Spirit-filled family. In Jesus' name. The family's undergoing all kinds of stress and pressure today. You know, the COVID lockdowns just about destroyed this nation. 44% of parents reported after the COVID lockdowns who had children under 18 living at home, they reported worse mental health as a result of the lockdowns. It it caused an increase in alcohol consumption, suicidal thoughts and feelings, and stress about being safe from physical and emotional violence among their kids. 24.8% of parents reported that their children's mental health had worsened since the pandemic. It caused an interruption in learning. It caused poor nutrition to happen in certain areas with kids that depended on free lunches. It caused confusion and stress for teachers. Parents were unprepared for the homeschooling tasks they had to take on. It created challenges maintaining this distance learning. It created gaps in child care. I heard a podcast the other day where a researcher was talking about the two-year gap we had for the COVID lockdowns and how some of that time, in his opinion, could not be regained with kids and what they lost in learning and in socialization. So rise in dropout rates, increased exposure to violence and exploitation. These are from secular sources. This isn't just Christians complaining. This is secular sources telling us what has happened to the family since COVID. Also, we've always dealt with fatherlessness, but I don't know if it's at a peak right now, but it's terrible in America. Over 24 million children in America are living without their biological father in the house. And I know some of you are champions, you're single mothers or single dads, and you're amazing at what you do, but I'm telling you, God's design is for a man and woman to be in that house raising their biological kids. That's God's plan. And there's really no substitute for it. God gives grace in other circumstances. Divorce has wrecked families and has for years in America, but I looked recently at Focus on the Families divorce research after 30 years, and this is what they said. Again, not just raining down on you, but I'm just going to preach some facts so without truth we we can have no freedom, right? So let's just preach some facts here. For divorcees, life expectancies for divorced men and women are significantly lower than for married people who have the longest of life expectancies. You want to live long? Get married. I'm going to preach this thing again this Sunday, all right? Hallelujah. A recent study found those who were unhappy but stayed married were more likely to be happy in five years later than those who were divorced. So there's something to be said with said about hanging with it and giving it some time. The health consequences of divorce are so severe that a Yale researcher concluded that being divorced and a non-smoker is only slightly less dangerous than smoking a pack a day and staying married. After a diagnosis of cancer, married people are more likely to recover, while divorced people are less likely to recover, indicating that the emotional trauma of divorce has a long-term impact on the physical health of the body. So men and women both suffer a decline in mental health following a divorce. But researchers have found that women are more greatly affected. So these are challenges that that are facing the family today. So these should matter to us because families matter to God. When God created a family, He created it to be the unit upon which all of society is built. The Bible begins with a family. As one writer said, it began with a blind date and ended with the marriage supper of the Lamb. It begins with God presenting a woman to a man to form a family. And it ends with this grand celebration of all the family of God coming together in heaven. Think about it. God used a family. When the world had gone completely haywire, and we had had the judgment of the flood, and the judgment of Babel, and all these, the judgment of of all of this, of Adam and Eve, boom, judgment after judgment after judgment. And then what happens when it comes to Genesis chapter 12? God calls a man and his family. That's how God brought covenant into the world and eventually brought salvation. He called a man who brought his family 
into the place of following God. Can somebody shout amen? Amen. Marriage and parenthood are God's plans. Marriage and parenthood. Get married and have kids. Get married and have kids. That's God's plan. Marriage represents His covenantal love that He has for you and I. That we love each other unconditionally in a marriage bond. Right? It's not based, it's for better or for richer, for poorer, and all that stuff. It's to be with someone regardless of circumstances. You learn to love that person on days when you feel like it and days when you feel less like it. You still love because it's covenant. And the deeper you go in a covenant love, the deeper the love and the feelings get. The deeper the ties grow when you walk in covenant love. And so God uses marriage as a picture of His love for us. And then God wants us to parent kids, to have kids and parent them well. And it's a picture of God's care for us. And He's training of us. And how God has our best intentions in mind. So marriage and parenthood represent God's love for the world. God lives, if we understand Trinity, God lives in community in a sense. And you can only love in community. And God takes us into His radius to experience that love with Him. So I'm going to give you three facts about great families. First of all, great families are Spirit-filled. Great families are Spirit-filled. Paul has given us instruction here. Be filled with the Spirit. This isn't an option. It's a command. Be filled with the Spirit. Here at this church, we believe in the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We believe that after you're saved, there's another work of the Spirit called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And God's will is that all of you be baptized in the Spirit. Some say, well, it'll happen to me when God gets ready. No, God's been ready for 2,000 years. On the day of Pentecost, He sent the Spirit, and the Spirit's been here in that capacity ever since then, and God's just waiting on you to step into it and walk into it by faith. It's God's blessing for you. It's God's will for your life. And having said that, it's God's will for your spouse to be filled with the Spirit. It's God's will for your kids to be filled with the Spirit. You say, well, maybe we shouldn't talk about those deep, heavy things. I was with a church leader recently in a great church situation. They said, well, we have, we have some people and we bring them into the church, but we don't talk about Holy Spirit. None of that's way too deep for them. We give them time. And then once they get discipled, we can introduce baptism of the Spirit. I left there thinking, dude, I, day one, I would talk about baptism in the Holy Ghost for these guys. Day one. Day one, I would talk about baptism in the Spirit. That's who we are. It's what we believe. You need it all. Amen? You need everything. Your family needs everything God has for them. And your kids aren't too young to be talked to about the Spirit or be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I don't care how young they are. Start praying in tongues. Start believing God for them to be filled. Start teaching them. Start leading them into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So so my youngest daughter, Alex, I have two daughters. My youngest was four years old, and we were uh, living in the Washington, D.C. area. And one night we had some guests in our home, and we gathered around in a circle, held hands and prayed before we all went to bed. And as we're in that circle, we're praying out loud, and we hear Alex... Praying in tongues. And so we're, we're, we kind of quietly all went. And I looked at my wife and we just went. So we sent her to bed, told her good night, and we came back downstairs and we're like, what was that? Was that real? Was she mimicking what she's heard from us? And our conclusion was, she was really praying, praying in tongues at four years old. I'd baptized her at four years old. We didn't have a church building. We were meeting in elementary school, so she wanted to be baptized. And I said, then tell me why you want to be baptized. Because I want Jesus in my heart. I want my sins forgiven. Bingo, you win. You're going to get baptized. Took her upstairs, filled the bathtub full of water, and baptized her. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. You don't have to wait to whatever your religious tradition told you you have to wait for. If they can tell you they want Jesus in their heart, they're baptized upon their profession of faith, bring them on. We'll baptize them here at the church. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Why? You need your kids in the kingdom. You need them baptized in the Holy Ghost. You need them filled with the Spirit. It is God's will for them to be filled with the Spirit. Acts 2. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my Spirit upon only the adults. 
only upon the senior citizens. No, he says, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Come on, that's your heritage. And your young men shall see visions and old men shall dream dreams. Get your kids baptized in the Spirit. When Jackie and I first came here to pastor in 2009, we were in the old sanctuary. And one night we, we had an evangelist friend of ours named Veronica McLaughlin come. And she ministered on a Sunday night. And we brought all the kids in and the youth in. And they received a, an, a, an incredible move of God. I'll never forget that night. There were like 60 plus people laid out, slain in the Spirit at the altar, and the kids were laying hands on each other to receive the baptism in the Spirit. My daughter was prophesying, and she was a middle schooler. She was prophesying as a middle schooler, and God started a revival in this church, and that was one of the watershed moments that began a revival in this church where, where we counted over 5,000 people receiving Christ within the span of a few years right here in this church. And it happened because of a great move of God. I can't understand why we don't want this today or why churches want to excuse it or explain it away or push it to a back room. I don't understand that. Let Fountain of Life be that church, Lord. Let us be the place. Come on, send it on down here. Let all the kids be filled with the Spirit, the youth be filled with the Spirit, Let it be a Holy Ghost church. Come on, somebody. Great families are filled with the Spirit. Great families worship together. Paul said, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. A Spirit-filled family worships together. And I know I'm a pastor. I don't beat y'all up very much, but I've been hanging around with these wild tent preachers all week. So get ready, all right? I'm going to preach to you as a pastor here. Get your kids in church. you got to get them in church. you got to get them in youth ministry. you got to get them in, in the children's ministry. Well, we don't like the kids' ministry. Then you come and volunteer. Bring your kids and make it better. Well, we don't like the youth ministry. Then you come and volunteer and get involved and make it better. Church should be priority number one in your family. I don't know how a COVID has hurt the society also, but, but boy, before COVID came, we'd taken our kids out. So I'm telling you, it's not that difficult. Make it a priority in your life to get the kids to the house of God. Get them under the tent. Get them in the presence of the Lord. You say, yeah, but my kid's just is a toddler. He's running around and he's, he's wild to hang on to. Yeah, but who knows what is impacting that child when they're under that tent. If you have to sit at the back or if you have to come and sit in the back of the church during a revival service. If you do that, who knows? Because the glory comes in a different manner when we come together and worship corporately. And I'm telling you, God can impact your family and just do crazy stuff. And two, you make it known to your kids that this is a priority in your life. I'm here today because of my mom's parents, my grandparents. They were Pentecostals. They believed God. They prayed for all of us family members. And my grandpa said it in the old time way. He said, I laid all you guys on the altar. I laid y'all all on the altar. said, God, whatever it takes, get them in the kingdom of God. And I was one of the first in the family to get saved. And I came in and I'd go stay with my grandfather some. He had spent 42 years underground in the coal mines. And he was retired. And when I would go, we would all get down in the middle of the floor and pray before we went to bed. And when it came Sunday, I mean, they were old school. They didn't cook. They had stuff left over. They put in the refrigerator. They, the car did not move to go to stores and banks. or Well, banks aren't open. Stores or grocery stores or restaurants. I don't know. That's the way they lived. It was only to church. And when family came, here's what they did. Well, y'all can go to church with us or you can stay here, but we're going to church. That was their priority. We're going to church. This is what we do. This is number one priority in our lives. And we set everything aside for that. Because there are several ways that you can miss a move of God. There are several things that will cause you to not receive from God. And I came up with a few of these just sitting on the platform listening to Brother Ted and Teddy this week. I started taking notes and I was thinking through Scripture. One of them is for you to get offended. Because you remember in Nazareth when Jesus came out in His ministry and the people saw Him and the people who knew Him, who grew up with Him, said, who does He think He is? 
And they grabbed him and they took him to the edge of the cliff and tried to throw him over, but he escaped. They got offended at him. And when you're offended, you can't receive. You get offended at me, you get offended at my staff, you get offended at a leader, you get offended at somebody in church because they didn't shake your hand. You must get over it. Come on, if you walk with that offense, you'll never receive anything from God. And what's worse is that offense in you will be magnified in your kids. And what you're missing out on, you think you're doing some grand service to your ego by missing out and snubbing everybody, it's really depriving your kids of a move of God and a revival in their hearts. I'm like Brother Hall used to do. Preach on, Brother Hall. Yeah, so don't be offended. And then when Jesus came back to Nazareth, it was the only place the Bible says He couldn't do many miracles. And why was that? One of two things had to be happening. Number one, they just didn't show up. Or number two, they showed up with no expectation. And both things can keep you from a move of God. If you don't show up, you're not going to have a move of God. If you put no effort forward, God's not going to bless you. Or if you come and have absolutely no passion for the things of God. I thought about Elisha and the king Joash. And when he went to him with the story of the arrows, you can read it and he goes, he says, strike the arrows on the ground and that's how God's going to defeat the Syrians. So he goes out there and he strikes them three times and evidently kind of half-heartedly. And the prophet comes and rebukes him. You should have done it more. God would have given you more. If you would have struck the ground more. And it it just speaks to me, we don't need to be doing things half-heartedly. Or showing up to church, looking at our watch, can't wait till we get to Pizza Hut. (laughs) Or missing revival because we've got to finish that Netflix series or my life's not complete. Oh, come on somebody, hallelujah. Come on, God has to be number one. He has to be... Seek first the kingdom of God. All these other things will be added to you. you got to take up your cross daily. It's all Jesus taught in discipleship. God has to be number one. And it's not only for you, it's for your kids also. Come on, somebody. you got to make it priority number one. In our family, this is just my example. Teddy said it last night. But in my family, we just decided our kids weren't going to be involved in anything that took them out of church. You're not going to be involved in any activity that takes you away from a church day. You can like it or lump it, but it's the way it's going to be. And when you grow up, you can thank me later. Because we set a priority. That this is going to be the priority in our house. We're going to serve the Lord. For me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I shouldn't tell this, but I'm going to tell it anyhow. So I have a friend named Dana. And I haven't talked about this at all, but I introduced Dana to my brother recently. My brother's awesome. He's a, he's a lawyer. And my brother says, I'm going to start the questioning. <laughs> Number one, do you like to go to church? <laughs> a lot. Because <laughs> if you're with Hans, you're going to go a lot. I love that we laughed about it. I love that question. Do you, that should be your friends asking, you know, do you want to be friends with Joe or Bob? Do you like to go to church a lot? Do you like to stay out late at revival? Do you like not knowing when you're going to get home at night? You can be my friend. Hallelujah. It's priority number one. Come on, somebody put your hands together. Give the Lord a praise. Third thing, great families understand submission. He said, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Then on the tail end of that, he says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. He's the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. 
Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for that He might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the Word, that He might present her to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that he should, she should be holy and without blemish. So, you know, a lot's been made of this, and there's a lot of theological argument about it. But here's what I think. If you look at the ancient family codes in Aristotle and other ancient uh, writers, they were very chauvinistic. They were very male-dominated. But what we find in Paul's writings and in the teachings of Jesus is a radical new way of valuing women. It really is a radical new way of valuing women. Because I'm going to tell you, women can preach, prophesy, lay hands on the sick, pastor churches, lead movements, start denominations, have healing ministries, all that and more. That's the way we believe here, and I can, I can show you scripturally. There, there are uh, feminine forms of diakonos and diakonoi with the deacons or even with apostles in the New Testament. If you don't believe God can heal the sick through women, go watch some old YouTube videos of Catherine Kuhlman. If you don't believe God can use women to start movements, go watch some stuff with, or read about Amy Simple McPherson's life. Went out to her house several years ago in L.A., and it was amazing what the woman accomplished. And during the Great Depression, she fed one million people during the Great Depression. And, I mean, it, it just it crazy miracles and stuff. So we believe it. So I don't think this is talking about wives serve in some subservient role with the husband lording and dominating over them. I think it is a first mutual submission, verse 21, of the whole body, but there is a divine order within the house that is a blessing when it works as it should. That is in the spirit of love. And that is with the husband taking the greater responsibility. I mean, wives, submit to your husbands. Okay, we got that. But then husbands, give your very life for your wife. Love her and cherish her as Christ loved the church. So I don't know, just from my own experience, here's how this whole submission thing worked out with us. Uh, I was married to a very bold and determined woman. So uh, when we would come to a decision or talk about something, we would, we would pray about it. We would, what's the, what do you feel from the Lord? What's the Lord speaking? And we would just share as complete equals. What is God saying? What's He doing? And there were some things, a few things I wanted to get into in life and wanted to pursue, and, and my wife didn't feel comfortable about it, and we didn't do it, and thank God we didn't do it. Come to find out, I don't think that was God's perfect plan for my life. But then when it came time to make the big decisions, and we did feel in unity together, and we came to this decision in prayer, I'm the one who had to pull the trigger. And I felt it was just God's way of saying, Hans, you pull the trigger and you make the decision because you're the main one responsible for this. And you're the one who has to be the pathfinder or has to be the one that gets out and leads point here. You know what a point person is? You know, the point man, like in Vietnam, when they would send the Marines on these little uh, reconnaissance missions, somebody would have to walk point. And the point person was usually the one who would be shot first. So men, I'm calling you to be the point man for your family. Be the one who gets out there and beats the path and says, I'll go lead the way so my family can be blessed and I will lay my life down for my family. It's like I went hiking a couple years ago on the Appalachian Trail and spent several days there with two other gentlemen. And we had one guy that was just, I mean, he was just blazing trail, so we let him go first. I was trying to uh, catch wind. And I'm glad he went first because he encountered a black bear. If I would have encountered a black bear, I don't know what I would have done. You know, the, the, I asked the guys, I said, what if we run into a bear? They said, just pray you're faster than we are. <laughs> just pray that you can get away before we do. So anyhow, yeah, glad someone was running point and found that bear there, hallelujah, so I didn't have to face it. And isn't that what we're called to do as men? And then children come into the blessing. So we don't uh, provoke the children to wrath, Paul says, but we pour the love and respect and honor and discipline into our kids. And so we have a reverse society now where kids become the parents. Or kids tell you what to do. 
I, I grew up, my mom was a loving person, but that would have lasted about four seconds. And we would have been put in our place. Right? I mean, come on. We need, don't be afraid to be a parent. Don't be afraid to be a parent. You don't be afraid to say no. Don't be afraid to say that friend you have, no more. You're not hanging around him anymore. Don't, I, I, my daughters can tell you stories. Their mama getting up one night, three o'clock in the morning. One of my daughters said they woke up and my wife was like this. God says get rid of the friend. Never to come back on this property. They turned out all right. They loved Jesus prophesied, moving the Spirit. They not... None of us are perfect, but they turned out pretty good. Amen? It took some of that praying and rebuking and seeing in the Spirit. You be the one that flows in the Holy Ghost. We used to play games. They said, we're not playing games with Mom. She moves in the Spirit. <laughs> She'll know. She, we can't. Hallelujah. Come on, be the parents. Have it together. Be Spirit-filled. Worship together and make it a priority and then understand the family submission and the structure of the family and God's going to bless you. Hallelujah. God's going to bless you. Can somebody shout hallelujah? Because your home is a church. Your home is a school. Your home is where they need to get instruction about the Lord. First of all, we come along as a church to help support that and help lift you up as parents. But we can't parents the kids for you. you got to do that. And you lead them well. And you lead them into the things of God. Don't let your kids grow up and go to college and never hear you pray in tongues. Don't let them go into the world and never know that you are a Holy Ghost saint that believed in the power of God. Don't let that happen. Let them know. Hallelujah. There are people today, there are churches. I, I talked to a church leader recently who I know who said, Brother Hans, you should never pray publicly in tongues over a microphone in church. I said, hold on, I do. He said, really? I said, yes, I do. I said, let me tell you a story. I was praying in tongues over the microphone at an altar call recently in our church and someone on this side of the church said, Pastor Hans, when you were praying in tongues, I got it all in English. And here's what the Lord told me. And somebody else on the other side of the church said, Pastor, when you prayed in tongues, I got it all in English. That's called the moving of the spiritual gifts in church. Oh, hallelujah, let it happen in your home. Prophesy over your home. I would go around my house and the doorposts would be lacquered down with olive oil. Where I knew we had prayed so much over the house, we had anointed prayer cloths, put them in their pillows, put them, sew them into their clothes. I don't care. Do everything you can to let those kids leave your house one day strong, full of the Word, full of faith, being exposed to miracles, flowing in the gifts of the Spirit, praying in the Holy Ghost, knowing that when a decision comes, I don't have to listen to the news to know what to do. I don't have to search social media to figure out wisdom in my life. No, I got it in the Word. Word. I got it in the Spirit of God and I know my mom and dad taught me right and they taught or maybe I, you know what some people believe or they criticize church kids because sometimes church kids get into some stuff and they say well see those people were raised in church they raised their kids in church and look what they've gotten into let me tell you something it doesn't guarantee you that your kids will never have problems but what raising them in church does guarantee you is that the seed of the Word of God is placed in their heart. That they've been in the environment and context of glory and anointing. And every night when they lay down, even if they're rebelling, God's going to come knocking. God's going to come calling. They can't outrun the call of God. They can't outrun the Spirit of the Lord. God's going to be after them all the days of their life. The protecting hand of God is going to be on them. Your prayers stand as a memorial before God. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. God will give you, you and your household. Claim Acts 16. Let your family be a family full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. Come on. Put your hands together and give the Lord a praise. Come on, somebody give him a shout in here. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, stand on your feet with me right now. Lift your hands. Let's pray right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for my family this morning. I pray for the families in this church this morning. 
And I pray, God, that we'd be just what we read about in Ephesians 5. Strong, Spirit-filled families. Praying and singing. Making melody in our heart. Submitting to one another. Living in the fear and reverence of Christ. That we fulfill these, these Scriptures in our families in the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, lift your hand right now and say, God, I just declare that over my family. Hallelujah, I declare it over my family. Some of you may be thinking, well, man, I've made a mess of it, Hans. I've goofed this up just every way you can possibly do it. Well, you can ask for forgiveness right now. God, forgive me. Let me be, let me be a better parent from this moment on. Come on, from this moment on, I see the Scripture now. A revelation has come. And now I open up my heart to what you want to do in my family. In Jesus' name. Hey, I'm Hans Hess. Thank you so much for watching today. And I just pray that this service has been a great blessing to you. Listen, many of you out there have needs. You have needs physically. You want healing in your body or you have uh, oppression or anxiety you're dealing with or, or the weight of an addiction or sin in your life. Whatever the issue is, you know, Jesus can handle it. And I want to pray for you today before we leave here and just believe God for the best in your life. You're a winner in Christ. I've read the end of the book and we win in the end. So pray with me this brief prayer. Come on, mean it with all of your heart. Father, in Jesus' name, forgive me of all my sin and wash it away. Heal my body. Touch my mind, Lord. Bring total freedom to me today, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And if you said that, you can say amen. And you know what? Each time a, a sports team wins a victory, they always have a celebration. So why don't go ahead and right where you are and just thank God and give God some praise. Thanks for joining us. Stay in contact with us and uh, come back and visit us.